fucking hell, it's so hot here, you can't imagine. That's the problem with those hotels. They overheat them and they won't let you open the windows. They don't let you control the heat. No, I can open the window, but if I do that, um, there'll be too much light. Hmm. And then your viewers won't be able to see me, which coming to think of it may be a plus, but still, <laughs> <laughs> you know, I'm a narcissist. I insist to be seen. They need Most to be seen. You will see me. <laughs> Who do you think you are? <laughs> so, um, Sam, I wanted to ask you today about your uh, interpretation of, of the shared fantasy space. I found this fascinating um, when, when you first told me about it. And then you have a concept that, that was developed from that called emotional artifacts that I'd like to get in with you today as well. Um, could you give us a brief outline of the shared fantasy space? No, I don't feel like talking about it. I've I've done so many videos about it. Can we talk about something else? Like, uh, okay, Women. okay, <laughs> wine, song, okay, yeah, <laughs> good fantasy, bloody hell, boring. Okay, a shared fantasy is is a form of paracosm. Paracosm is kind of an alternative reality, alternative universe. So, shared fantasy is an alternative universe constructed by the narcissist who then invites a potential intimate partner or source of supply to enter this universe and to adhere to its percepts, to its tenets, to its underlying uh, foundational principle. When I say adhere, it means to accept the paracosm or the shared fantasy as real. Mm. And when I say adhere, it also means to subject one's cognitions and emotions mm. to the exigencies and parameters of the shared fantasy. So the shared fantasy is a mind warping, mind altering experience. Mm. It's not just Disneyland. Mm. It's like as if you were buying a ticket to Disneyland and then you could never exit because Disneyland would have become your world and you would have had to accept the reality of Mickey Mouse and the fact that, I don't know, there's a castle on the hill and so on. So, you have to reside in the shared fantasy from the moment you're invited in. Mm. Um, shared fantasies are the way narcissists create dependency in, in the intimate partner because what they do, they idealize the intimate partner and then they allow the intimate partner to form emotional attachment with the idealized image. So, and this is a form of self-love. So when the intimate partner falls in love with the narcissist, he is not, he doesn't fall in love with the narcissist. As you correctly noted, the narcissist is unknowable. It's mm. just unknown quantity. You can't fall in love with the unknown. Mm. So the intimate partner doesn't fall in love with the narcissist. The intimate partner falls in love with his or her idealized image that the narcissist grants you access to. Mm -hmm. So the narcissist idealizes you then lets you be in touch with your idealization, and this is irresistible. Mm. And you fall in love with yourself or with your idealized self. So this is the shared fantasy. Now, shared fantasy has two effects, which are not often discussed. One is what is called mass psychogenic illness. There's a clinical term. Mass psychogenic illness is the correct term for, ch for shared psychosis. The suspension, the suspension of disbelief, suspension of judgment, the ability to adopt a we versus they mentality, the adherence to rules of the game within the shared fantasy that are often unrealistic, suspension of reality or reality, impairment of reality testing. All this is known as mass psychogenic illness. This is one effect and it affects both the narcissist and the intimate part. The second thing that happens in a shared fantasy and it happens exclusively to the victim is the pro is prolonged grief disorder. That's a new disorder that's been identified a few, a year or two ago. Um, about 10% of people, when they emerge from a, in, an injurious, hurtful relationship, mm -hmm. they are unable to recover. No matter what, they're simply mm -hmm. unable to recover. They grieve and mourn forever. Mm -hmm. And this is known as prolonged grief disorder. So the vast majority of the victims of narcissists have prolonged grief disorder. Mm. Now, prolonged grief disorder is very interesting in itself. So maybe it merits another podcast. Mm -hmm. This is newly discovered and there are numerous things that apply to victims of narcissists. But the question is, 
why does the shared fantasy have this power? Why does it generate mass psychosis and prolong grief? And, I mean, what, what in it? What in it does this? I mean, when you go to Disneyland, when you exit, you don't have a prolonged grief disorder unless you're a Jew. The price of the ticket can do this to you. So shared fantasy is a kind of Disneyland. Why, what's in, what in it causes these um, shattering effects? So the reason is, of course, that the shared, the shared fantasy is actually a trance-like or pseudo-hypnotic pseudo -hypnotic state. The shared fantasy involves a, prim, a primary stage called grooming or love bombing, which induces in the victim essentially a trance state or a pseudo-hypnotic state, mm. clinically known as a dissociative state. In a dissociative state, we have several effects. I'm, I'm leading to the artifacts, but unfortunately you have to go this way. I mean, there's no, no other I, way. I, I, think, I think people need to hear this. And I should have said at the beginning where this conversation came from, just, just so people are anchored is, I've been in a, a narcissistically abusive relationship. Again, good, good for me. That's brand damaging information. Do with it what you will. Um, and I asked Sam, is it possible to experience in artificially induced emotions? Because I thought I was feeling things I shouldn't be feeling. And everything Sam is telling us now leads you through an understanding of the, the superstructure behind how it definitely happens, how it happens. You must understand the shared fantasy space and you must understand, uh, you know, exactly as you're saying, this kind of dissociated hypnotic state because everybody, your clients, mine, the victims of narcissistic abuse kind of they come round and they go, what, what, what did I do? What was that? And maybe the prolonged grief state is they're not really coming out. They're sort of staying in that shared yeah. fantasy space. Uh, we should do a, a different, a, a whole other podcast on that as well. You're right. Mm -hmm. I, I just wanted to say that so people are yeah, they're anchored you. in. Yeah. Thank you for clarifying. Yeah, well, I'm leading to, to to emotional artifacts. Emotional artifacts are simulated emotions. They're not real. But we'll come to it in, in a minute. We, we need to understand how they come about. Unfortunately, mm. we have to go a long way. Mm. So there is this shared fantasy, which is essentially a dissociative state, or in, in colloquial terms, it's a trance state or a pseudo-hypnotic state and so on. And it involves amnesia. So there's a lot of forgetting involved. Mm. Um, it involves depersonalization. The victim often feels that it's not she who is involved, but kind of either someone else or she let go of herself. She's kind of observing herself on the outside. This is known as depersonalization. There's derealization, also colloquially known as gaslighting. Derealization is when you misinterpret reality or you believe that you are misinterpreting reality or that reality is not real and what is real is not reality, etc. So there are problems with gauging reality and, and judging reality. And, and so on. So this is, and gaslighting does this to you. And finally, there's fantasy. The, the paracosm fantasy is the opposite of reality, of course. And the main aim of fantasy is to prevent you from acting. Now, people confuse fantasy with dream. When you dream, when you have a daydream, or when you dream about becoming, for example, you dream of becoming me. I know that. So when you... <laughs> <laughs> because I'm more handsome lately. No, but if you dream, a dream is a practical thing. It's a step in planning. Mm. It usually results in some interface with reality. It could be a failed interface, but there's always an interface with reality via planning. Fantasy is the exact opposite. The main aim of fantasy is to inhibit action, to prevent you from interfacing with reality, mm -hmm. to keep you captive captive in a dreamlike state, but it's not dream, it's fantasy. So mm. fantasy, the paracosm, these are the elements of the dissociation. It's like a bad dream. You're unable to act, unable to move because of the fantasy. You're not sure you are yourself because of depersonalization. You're not sure that what you're witnessing is real, derealization, and you keep forgetting things. Mm. So put all these together, you're in a dissociative state. At that point, when you're most vulnerable, when your ability to interact with reality is, had been disabled to its maximum, the abuser starts a process called entraining. I believe that I was the first to apply the concept of entraining to abuse in October last year. 
And training is a concept from neuroscience. It's when external input, such as music, has an effect on brain waves, so as to create, so as to cohere and synchronize the brain waves in a specific form or way. So uh, the science of entraining in neuroscience had demonstrated in multiple ways that we can use external input to affect the brain to produce coherent, cohesive structures of brain waves. This is this could be easily described as brainwashing. So the abuser use, uses entraining to brainwash. Now, what is entraining? Entraining is any external stimulus. Could be music, but could be verbal abuse. If you listen to the abuser when he verbally abuses you, it is exactly like music. First of all, he repeats many sentences again and again and again. There's a lot of repetition. Mm. It's like a refrain in a song. Like it's like he's singing the abuse. And there's a there's refrain. A and the refrain is this sentence that keeps recurring, you know. Second thing, the abuse is never never typical speech. It's a, not a speech act. It's not like people talking. The abuse is structured. It has a kind of mathematical regularity. It has repeated phrases. It resembles music very much. I call it the music of abuse. Exactly like music entrains the brain, abuse, verbal abuse, entrains the brain. The abuser creates in your brain specific wave patterns. Now he doesn't know what he's doing because he's not a neuroscientist, but he's a predator. So it comes to him naturally. These brain patterns in your mind render you a resonance or an extension of the abuser. Your brain synchronizes with his brain. Your brain becomes one with him. The waves in your brain reflect totally the waves in his brain. He had penetrated your brain, taken over, and generated waves identical to his waves. From that moment, you are enmeshed. And training leads to enmeshment or merger fusion mm. in a relationship. So this is the second phase in training. I mean, uh, third phase, fantasy, dissociation, fantasy, dissociation, and training, enmeshment. The minute you're enmeshed, you are no longer you no longer exist as an independent entity in any meaningful sense of the word. It's a little like hypnotic suggestion. In hypnosis and in abuse, suggestible people are the core constituency. So what do we have in hypnosis? We have words, post-hypnotic suggestions. You know, post-hypnotic suggestions. You wake up from the hypnosis and I tell you Brussels and you kill your neighbor. Which anyhow you wanted to kill. So it's the same with in training in abuse. Mm. The abuser maintains post hypnotic control over you. He had entrained your brain, he had engendered these brain waves. And from that moment, anytime he repeats the abusive text, the catechism, the catechism of abuse, anytime he does that, he generates in your mind these brain waves. And he has kind of post-hypnotic control over you. This is the entraining. These are scientific facts. This is not a conspiracy theory or wild speculation. We have done this with music. So I don't see any difference between speech and music, mm. especially structured, repetitive speech, such as abuse. So then at that point, when you had become a slave, or in computer terms, a client. Mm. When you become a, a slave or a client of the abuser, mm. you are at his disposal. And at that stage, the abuser seeks to transfer regulatory functions from you to himself. So let me recap. I know I'm repeating myself, but this is extremely complex material. And recapping and is helpful. All, all of it is essential. Everybody has to understand yeah. each piece 
to the puzzle here, or it's not, or it's not going to make sense. Yeah, and everyone can can spot himself, can find himself somewhere. Yes. So, it starts with grooming. The grooming is intended to induce a dissociative state, a state which involves dissociation, amnesia, depersonalization, derealization, fantasy, and so on. And this is called the shared fantasy. It's a little like hypnosis, a lot like trance. When this happens, the abuser starts to entrain you. He creates in your mind brainwaves which reflect his brainwaves. Your brainwaves are totally synced, totally synchronized with his brainwaves. From that moment, you are one mind. Mm -hmm. You're a hive mind. Become one mind. By the way, this has been documented in, in rock bands. Mm -hmm. the, there were studies of, of uh, the brain activity of players in a rock band. All their brains generated identical waves mm -hmm. when they started to play. It's like it was one mind. So you become one mind with the abuser. Why? What for? Ab the abuser wants you to transfer regulatory functions. To do that, he needs to disable your autonomous brain waves. He needs to implant in you, like the Manchurian candidate, he needs to implant in you his own brain waves. So now your brain is a reflection, an imitation, a replica, a copy of the abuser's mind. Of the abuser's brain. So now the abuser takes away from you regulatory functions. You regulate as a healthy person, you regulate your emotions, you regulate your moods. There's, there are many regulatory functions taking place every second of the day. Mm. And what the abuser does, he takes these regulatory functions away from you. You're not, you're defenseless. You don't have your own wave patterns to defend against this intrusion. It's like your firewall has been disabled. It's like the, in, the abuser had installed malware in your mind. And so now he uses it to transfer regulatory funds. From that moment, the abuser regulates your emotions. The abuser regulates your moods. And anyone who has been in an abusive relationship will tell you this, yeah. that the, the abuser controls their moods. The abuser makes them happy, makes them unhappy, makes them depressed. Makes them, it comes from the abuser. It's external. And the abuser does this using a series of techniques. First is intermittent reinforcement. Hot and cold, love you, hate you, and so on. Second is approach avoidance. I want to be with you. I don't want to be with you. Trauma bonding, which you had discussed a lot. And abuse verbal abuse, other. So using these techniques, the end result is that you are an empty shell. All your internal regulation had been outsourced to the abuser, externalized. And so you stand there like a zombie or a robot in a bad horror or sci-fi movie, and you're waiting for the abuser to activate the very various modules of your mind. The abuser decides how you're going to feel. The abuser decides what your mood is going to be. The abuser decides even what you're going to think and when. You have handed control totally to your abuser via the process of shared fantasy, dissociative shared fantasy, and then training. These twin processes had rendered you a, a tool, a machine, a device used by the abuser. The, the entrainment, and now I'm coming to emotional artifacts. The entrainment and training you means reorganizing your mind. That's the meaning. When, when, I, when the abuser entrains you, what he does, he accesses your mind, he activates certain wave patterns, he deactivates others, and so on. So he's reorganizing your mind. Your mind. The minute he does this, he generates... You continue, but you continue to, to generate emotions and cognitions. I mean, that is unstoppable. No one can stop this. As long as you're alive, you're going to emote, you're going to think. Many people, many scholars think that emotions are subspecies of cognitions. But at any rate, you're going to have emotions, you're going to have cognitions. This is unstoppable. Not even the abuser can turn it off. But what the abuser does, having taken over your mind, he had rendered your emotions 
and your cognitions, not yours. So we call this non-autonomous cognitions or in non-autonomous emotions. This is a clinical term, non-autonomous cognitions. Non so you continue to generate emotions and cognitions. You continue to experience them as authentic, as yours, but they are not yours. They are induced in you by the abuser, not intentionally sometimes, often actually not intentionally. It's a predator. It's like a shark. You know, the shark doesn't analyze the blood before it, it pounces. I mean, sharks, that's what they do. Predators, that's what they do. They take over your mind. And from that moment, any cognition and emotion you have is actually a reflection of cognitions and emotions of the abuser because the abuser had taken over your mind. And all the brave patterns and brain waves and so on and so forth in your mind are not yours at all. Although, although obviously you subjectively experience them as if they were yours, obviously. Would, would it even be possible for the target to acquire some of the mental health issues that the abuser has? Like if I'm not prone to abandonment Absolutely. anxiety, but I suddenly find myself riddled with abandonment anxiety, is that yes, possible? Of course. of course, everything. Your brain becomes a clone of the abuser's brain. Now, everything I'm telling you is well documented in neuroscience. But in neuroscience, they studied the effect of music. So, for example, uh, they, they demonstrated that a single mind, a single mind can take over a group of minds uh, via music. Mm. They demonstrated that if you listen to a waltz, your brain will react with the same frequency as the waltz and actually will become, your brain will become a giant waltz machine. Mm. All the brain waves will be canceled and the only brain wave that will remain, it's called the spike, will be equal to the frequency of the waltz. That's why our bodies move when we listen to music because we have no other waves, only this wave. It becomes dominant, it moves the body. So in the study of entrainment or entraining via music, there are, there are con conclusions, conclusive findings that show one, that one mind can take over another via music. Two, that music can eliminate all autonomous brain waves and induce a non-autonomous brain wave from the outside. Music, simple mm. music, waltz, <laughs> not mm. abuse. Uh, other, there are other findings, very frightening findings, by the way. So I think abuse is even worse than music because the exposure to the abuse is much bigger. And I mean, how many times do you listen to the same song? Right. But the exposure to the abuser is much more extensive. The surface of the exposure Immersive. is much bigger. It's repetitive. Mm. So it's, it's, you know, it's, it creates pathways in the mind, in the mm. brain, mm. physical pathways, whenever you hear. That's how psychotherapy works. The psychotherapy, mm. talk therapy, has this effect on the brain. The brain is neuroplastic. Mm. But the brain is much more neuroplastic than we had known. And so I have, I have a video from October last year mm. about entraining. It's a video about the neuroscientific findings regarding and training. Mm. So anyone and everyone can go and listen to this video. It's only 15 minutes. And it describes this, to my mind, terrifying findings. Mm. We are far less independent than we think. Far less. We are far, far more influenced by outside stimuli than we ever imagined. It's absolutely shocking. And... Um, so there is no doubt in my mind that the abuser has a massive impact mm. via entraining on the victim's mind to the point of taking over. But the activity of the mind continues regardless. Mm. So you will continue to generate emotions and you will think they're yours. They're not yours. Cognitions, they're yours. They're not yours. The waves of the abuser reflected in your brain, your brain is a clone, will be interpreted as yours. So if he is anxious, you're anxious. If he's narcissistic, you will become narcissistic. If he's, you will begin to mirror the abuser. You will become, you begin to be, to become the abuser. This process used to be described as enmeshment. 
And there were there were big studies on folia 2, madness in two. And later it was called shared psychotic disorder in the DSM, shared psychotic disorder. We know that people become clones of each other. There is even a study, a famous study on the physiological level. Women who had been put, nursing students, who had been put in the same building, their menstruation synchronized mm -hmm. and they all had, they all men started to menstruate on the same day. Mm -hmm. We are synchronized animals. We sync to each other. We, we become one in, in social groups and we always become one. We always become a hive. There is a colony element that we tend to deny and ignore because we live in an individualistic age. Mm -hmm. The individual is God. The individual is the idol. But as the object relation scholars in the 1960s in Britain, in the United Kingdom, had written, this is nonsense. What we call individual, what we call self, mm -hmm. is relational. Mm -hmm. It's the outcome of interactions with numerous other people. It's a Venn diagram. Mm -hmm. These two circles, we are the common area. So it's, it's ridiculous to claim that we are, you know, not reacting to outside influences and so on. So these emotions that you experience is yours, but are actually not yours. Yeah. They, they are the abusers. These are the artifacts. Once the, once the shared fantasy is over, you have a problem because it's, be, it's a dissociative state. So you don't remember. There's no memory. Memory is, is the foundation of identity. And identity is your bulwark, is your defense against artifacts, against intrusion from the outside. What is identity? Identity is protected by boundaries. Identity is where I end and you begin. If you don't have an identity, you're wide open. If you don't have memory, you don't have identity. So the disruption to memory in the dissociative state uh, creates identity disturbance. And then you're not able to resist intrusion by the abuser, but even when the abuser is gone, you can't reconstruct. There's no ability to reconstruct because there's no memory. Yeah, you've been wanting to say something since you were young. <laughs> the, um, the problems I'm having with my memory, specifically to um, examples of abusive behavior in the relationship, I think if I understand you correctly, you're saying it's because a, a disassociative state has been induced in me. Yeah, dissociative would that, state. Would that dissociative state increase during periods of abuse? Would I, would I then, am I more likely to forget abuse than just like a cup of coffee then? You're likely to forget anything the abuser would like you to forget. Sometimes the abuser wants you to not forget the abuse. He mm. wants to teach you a lesson, kind of mm. condition you. Mm. Sometimes he wants you to forget the abuse because he's in the love bombing stage or grooming stage. Mm. So it is the abuser that decides what you will forget. The abuser's control is total. There has been studies in and training where we were able to reconstruct a musical piece from EEG, from wave patterns of the brain. Wow. As, uh, um, one of the researchers constructed a Mozart piece just by being given the EEG. So now what is a musical piece? Musical piece has many voids, has many empty spaces, empty. So a musical piece is a kind of simulation mm -hmm. of memory and dissociation. Mm -hmm. Think of abuse as music. It has empty, empty, mo empty moments mm -hmm. with no sound and moments with sound. But the abuser decides whether it's Mozart or a Bach or Deep Purple. It's the abuser's decision. So the abuser, directs your dissociation it's directional dissociation and i will not go into it right now but the typical reaction is the creation of self states it's it's very complex what happens after that is pretty complex to the victim it's interesting that it's got this musical element because isn't in the myth of narcissus his partner is is echo and she simply echoes whatever he says which is a yeah. perfect metaphor for brain entrainment isn't it yeah true I think the repetition element is critical in music and critical in abuse. And I think abuse is a form of music, in effect. So when I said to you, oh, could I be caused to feel um, love and obsession that I don't really genuinely feel? Um, you do. You, you do. You think you do. 
Okay. But, but these are imported feelings. These are these are, are projections. They, are they hers? Are they her feelings about herself? Yes. Yes. Ah. So you experience them as yours, of course. It's inconceivable to you that your mind is, had been hijacked. It is. And been snatched. Basically snatched. Yeah. It's inconceivable to you. You still yeah. maintain the core of I am. Yeah. I am. So you would you would take ownership of these. Right. Of these in, in, intruders. Think of it as a virus. Yeah. When the virus enters the body, it penetrates a healthy cell. Yes. Now, the healthy cell doesn't say, excuse me, uh, you're a virus. Get out of here. We don't tolerate immigration. No. The healthy cell accepts the virus mm. and begins to copy the virus. The healthy cell copies the virus. Mm. It becomes a machine for copying the virus because the healthy cell doesn't make a distinction between him, itself and the virus. So the healthy cell says, if you're here, you must be okay. You must be me. Shit. You must be me Shit. because you are DNA, your RNA. You must be me. No other explanation. It's me. Okay, I'm going to copy you. Just so the audience is hearing what you're saying, when these um, external cognitions and emotions come through i hope everyone can hear how dangerous it is that instead of going oh god i'm being abused and this isn't my thought i'm the victim of abuse you are thinking pre-consciously this is my spontaneous thought and yes. my spontaneous feeling yes. you can't even begin to resist that what do you you wouldn't what are you resisting yourself yeah and many people many victims would describe you to you this sense of inner battle mm. this sense of they are fighting themselves somehow they they mm. feel torn mm. they feel ego incongruent they feel mm. like they're falling apart they feel and they don't understand why mm. but actually they're battling an invasion they're they're battling uh, a, a pathogen coming from the inside right now again with the example of the virus the cell sees a package of dna coming its way or rna that's a virus and the cell says, wait a minute, RNA is what I typically do. Mm. Like you would say, emotions is what I typically have. Yeah. And the cell says, okay, RNA is what I typically do, mm. so I'm going to do it. And begins to copy the RNA, which is the virus. It's not the cell. It's a mistake. You would say the same. Emotions is what I typically do. So if I have an emotion, it must be mine. And I'm going to own it. Yeah. I'm going to adopt it. After the abuser is gone, this continues. Why? Because you don't have memory. You don't have the glue. The, the glue that holds your identity together is gone for that period. So you don't have any firewall. You don't have a way to fight back these emotions. They, they linger. They linger for a while because you don't have memories of being you. During this period, you don't have memories of being you. Mm. It's that critical. During this period, you have memories of being her, but not memories of being you. Even when you think you have memories of being you, these are, these are memories of being her. It's pretty shocking, but we're beginning to, in, in, in clinical psychology, we're beginning to accept this. It's, a, it's programming, like cult programming. Well, and it would explain pretty much any question that a client would have about what they're experiencing about recovery from narcissistic abuse or not being able to recover from narcissistic abuse. And the not being able, I'm now wondering if you're sort of, you're trapped in like a graveyard shared fantasy space, even after they've gone, it's not like they close it down for you. Then it's not like they go, oh, well, I'm leaving now. So let's, you don't need this anymore. Let me unhook you. They just leave it in. Yeah, that's a prolonged grief. The prolonged grief disorder is when you mourn two things. Mm. When you mourn uh, the self-love that you had experienced, mm. because the narcissist allows you, lets you experience self-love, true mm. self-love. Mm. You fall in love with the idealized image that the narcissist creates of you. Mm. And that is irresistible. So you mourn this. But even more importantly, you mourn the missed time. You mourn the lost time. There's a period, there's a hiatus, there's, a, there's a, a, a lacuna, there's a vacuum where you should have been. 
it is a two-year-long uh, vacuum, it is a half-year-old vacuum, could be 20-year-long vacuum. Mm -hmm. But in this period, you did not exist in any meaningful sense of the word. The abuser had taken over and supplanted you, substituted for you. You became a, a clone. Uh, you, you did not really exist. You lack, you lack functional memory. You felt very often that you behave in ways which are alien to you, mm. a process called estrangement. Mm. You felt derealized very often. You were not sure about reality, what's true, what's not, what's going on. What... And you were in a, in a fantastic space, in a paracosm. So this time is lost, totally lost. And when you come to and recover, it's like you've been in coma. Imagine you've been in coma for 10 years and you wake up. You will mourn the, ten, the lost 10 years. But in coma, at least, no one takes over your mind. In <laughs> here, yes. So part of the job of recovery then post-narcissistic abuse should probably be trying to distinguish what's, what's mine from what's theirs because it will Absolutely. all be modeled. Absolutely. I have several videos on distinguishing introjects, distinguishing mm. internal voices, mm. making the work of telling which voices are genuinely, authentically yours mm. and which are imported or fake or false. Or... So this is uh, one thing. And second thing, memory recovery is crucial. And that's why we, we have many scholars working on false memories, abuse memory. This memory is crucial. Yeah. One of the main reasons, one of the main reasons therapists were trying to kind of recover or retrieve child, se childhood sexual abuse memories is that the main problem with abuse is the ruination of memory, the undermining of memory. Trauma is about memory. Trauma is dissociative by definition. Yes. Even complex trauma is dissociative by definition. Indeed, yeah. indeed, one of the main criteria of borderline personality disorder is dissociation. It's one of the DSM criteria, dissociation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And Judith Herman, the mother of CPTSD, mm -hmm. she, wants, she wants borderline personality disorder to be abolished as a diagnosis. Mm -hmm. She says, what is this nonsense? It's all mm -hmm. complex, complex trauma, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. and she's right. I fully agree with her. All these conditions, narcissism, these, that, they're all complex trauma. Mm -hmm. They all involve massive disruptions to, to, memory, to continuity and congruence of memory. This is what the abuser is doing to you. Mm. And so you can't recover because you can't, you can't retrieve your memories. After you had retrieved your memories, you can reform connective tissue. You can reform yourself, your self. And then having formed or reformed yourself, you can get acquainted with it. And then you're able to tell which voices are real and which are not, but not before. Not before you had recovered your memories and reconstituted or reconstellated yourself. So the job then is distinguishing between uh, what are your interjects, what are their interjects, and then coming back to yourself and trying to recover your memories. And, and you're saying the memories during that period of abuse where you were not present, that's yeah. what you must, must yeah. recover yeah. so that you get your yeah, identity. That's, that's classical thinking. That's, that's not me. That's very classical. That's, we do this with sexual abuse uh, in, in DID, in DID work. This is done in dissociative identity disorder, multiple personality disorder. We do this regularly. The only th thing is to extend it to all abuse. Yes. Now it's now it's common in some types of abuse. Yes. Because there was no understanding of, of entraining. Yes. They said, ah, sexual abuse, there's an invasion of the body. Ah, mm. that, that's bad. Let's mm. deal with it. Mm. But verbal abuse is an invasion of the mind. It's mind rape. Mm. It's entraining. So, but they were not aware of the concept of entraining. It didn't exist until mm. recently. Entraining shows us that words, sounds, sounds, music, words, they can synchronize brainwaves to the point that original, autonomous, independent brainwaves are eliminated. Gun, dead. <laughs> Nema, as we say in the Balkans. <laughs> well, that, that, would, uh, that would account for memory loss, a strange behavior, feeling other people's emotions. Yeah, you're not uh, you. You're, you're, not you you're, you're, you're really just not you. You're, 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 not you're you. a clone of them. Yeah. 
it's really disturbing. It's a really, yeah. it's a really sick idea, but um, it encompasses everything. It encompasses all the confusion, all the bewilderment that you, you described. You said it was estrangement. You become estranged to yourself yeah. through this process. And so I want then, to go on. Please, sorry, please go ahead. No, no, no. Uh, ju just that um, when people are walking away from a narcissistic abusive relationship and they think, oh my God, they're so wonderful. And I was so in love and the sex was great and I'm obsessed with them. We really should put a question mark on all of those feelings and all of those cognitions because it might not be yours. That they, might be the narcissist. Yes, they implanted this in your mind within the yeah. shared fantasy. Mm. The, I want to repeat, just mm. to be clear, mm. everything I've said is the common wisdom in certain types of abuse, mm. which are physical, mm. like sexual abuse. We just need to take the very same concepts mm. and, and apply them to verbal abuse mm. or psychological abuse. Mm. That's all. That's all we need to do. And add, add the idea of entraining as the mechanism, how it's done. Because until now, no one understood how it's done. Why the dissociation? Why the memory gaps? Why the feeling? Why the estrangement? The feeling that you are not you. Very often a victim will tell you, I don't know what came over me. It wasn't me. I, I don't know why I did this. <laughs> it, didn't feel, it didn't feel like me. I would have never done this. I did. Victims deny sometimes. So, me? No, I never did. I would have never done this. No way. Yeah. Yeah. So, yes. so, the, so, the, so me asking you somewhat naively, I realize now, is it possible I could be feeling things that I don't really feel? The answer is yes, but it's way more than just having oh, you feel a feeling that isn't yours. It's that your mind is completely hacked like a computer for a period of time. Think of the, think of the abuser as a parasite. A parasite who invades your mind and then colonizes it mm. and then subverts it and transforms it into a factory. Mm. So that's what parasites do. Parasites, for example, in cats, parasites in cats, they change the behavior of cats completely. They make cats into mice lovers. I'm kidding you not. You don't have to believe me. Go online. <laughs> Parasites subvert the brain of the mouse, of the cat, and render the cat a mouse lover because the parasite needs the mouse as a vector of transmission. So parasites have this capacity to alter the minds. Of, so that's what the abuser does. He's a parasite. He invades your mind colonizes it, transforms it, and uses it as a factory. What does it produce in this factory? Cognitions and emotions, which are conducive to the sustenance or sustainability of the shared fantasy. Mm -hmm. Because it is within the shared fantasy that he controls your regulatory functions. I have a question for you. This, is, this will be a good one. How do, after the narcissistic relationship, can we, and how would we, close that shared fantasy space or is that even a useful thing to attempt to do the minute you recover your your memories and distinguish the the fake or inauthentic introjects from the authentic introject mm. the shared fantasy cannot continue the shared fantasy relies critically on dissociation mm. on dissociation and the suspension of a state of self right. of a constellated self so self is a defense against such intrusions. The self has boundaries. It's, uh, so the self is a defense against the world. It's where you, you the boundary is where the, your self ends and the world begins. Mm. When the self is not constellated, is porous and so on, you have psychosis. The psychotic person confuses internal objects with external objects because he has no constellated self. Uh, same with the narcissist. He confuses external with internal. Because he has no self. Narcissus has no self. That's the irony. He's selfless. Especially me. I'm selfless. So the, the minute you have a self, which must be constructed on foundation of continuous memories. Mm. So the minute you have a self and the dissociation is done, the shared fantasy will crumble. Cannot, cannot be sustained. Okay. Um... Uh, the, the reason why I'm, I'm, I'm struggling to speak is because I'm processing this uh, for me. I'm processing this selfishly as, as well. And it's a lot. It's actually, well, there hasn't really been anything new that I've heard in narcissistic abuse for, for a long time, but and especially in narcissistic abuse recovery. This is a major, 
major piece of the puzzle. It's a change in orientation. It's a change in orientation. There are other changes taking place, which mm. are in academia. It mm. starts in academia, and then, you know, 10 years later, it's in self-help books. And, mm. Like Judith Herman mm. started with complex trauma, then Walker. And so uh, in academia now, there are, there are quite a few revolutionary trends. For example, we are seriously, I'm saying we because I'm now I'm deeply in, in these circles and so on. Mm. And because I'm one of the main proponents of this. Mm. So we are seriously considering to dispense with the concept of individual. And instead of self, to talk about an assemblage of self states with a selection mechanism, mm. central selection mechanisms. Mm. One example of a major, major change because then the whole concept of personality disorder crumbles. There's no such thing as personality. There's no such thing as self. And what you have, you have self states. And what we call today personality disorder is the tendency to select certain self states regularly and so on. So here's one, one direction. Another direction is to regard trauma as a language, a language element, so that actually we use trauma to make sense of the world and to organize it. And so this is why so many people are wedded religiously wedded to their trauma. They refuse to let go of the trauma. Mm. Never mind what you do. They mm. are invested emotionally in the trauma. They love the trauma. They sleep with the trauma. They, I mean, because the trauma is, a, is, their, is their language. They make sense of the world through the trauma. They, are, they organize the universe and imbue it with meaning via the trauma. Take away the trauma. You make instantly the world meaningless to them mm. and so on. So trauma is a language. There are uh, dissociation, the role of dissociation. So I begin, we begin to distinguish between total dissociation and what we call uh, permeable, permeable dissociative partitions. So disso dis partial dissociation. Mm -hmm. So for example, self states that trade some information, but not all the information. Yeah. So there will be a common repository of information shared by all the self states but there will be proprietary information specific to the self-states alone. And these are permeable dissociative partitions. It's a fascinating concept because it explains many things we couldn't explain until now. And there's nothing, there's nothing in that that I would, I mean, obviously I haven't, I haven't studied it, but like what you're talking about, the selector of different states, the permeability between, and not to assume there's a, an equal permeability between different states. Why would there be? There should be different levels of permeability between different states because mm -hmm. of protection and uh, self-image and perceptual filters. I like that. In fact, I would just I would, I would I would just say, well, that's it. That's what we're looking for. the The idea of one self is really, really out outmoded. It's really, really outdated. And the personality, as as I, I saw you say in a video, like it's the very notion of personality is just an, an interchangeable mask. But we talk about it as though it's a thing, it's you. No, it was never you. Persona is Greek for mask. So personality disorder implies this order, a, an ordered personality. What the hell is that? Show me one. I'd love to see him or her. Yeah, there's a lot of abstractions, a lot of idealizations, but yeah, yeah. ideals that have no place anymore, I think. We... Yeah. Uh, current state of knowledge does not support these really antiquated approaches. Don't forget that the concept of self came into being mm. when the atomic theory was at its height. Mm. So like atom, the mm. indivisible particle, mm. you know, mm. like atom, self. Mm. Uh, the self is the atom of the person. It's the indivisible yeah. part. Every generation is influenced by, by the mores and the myths and the narratives so you know this the this the psyche the soul used to be compared to a typewriter mm. that was the high tech of the time <laughs> then it's compared to a computer yeah and yeah. because there are computers now what what yeah. else can we compare it to computers yeah. No? Yeah. so this is the so we shouldn't take these things too too seriously the humans are fluid mm. fluid and recombine all the time we know for example for sure there's no such thing as memory. That's already been established like 20 years ago. There's no such thing as memory. Every time you, every time you try to remember something, 
-hmm. you reconstruct the memory from zero, from scratch. Right. You take part from here, part from there, motions, this, that, you put them all together and you reconstruct the memory. Consequently, mm -hmm. all memories are fiction. Right. Well over 90% of memories have never happened the way you think they had happened and close to 50% had never happened, period. All memories of fiction sounds like a quote that could have been written by George Orwell. <laughs> yeah, you speak. <laughs> Thor a thoroughly Orwellian idea. Memory is fiction. Fiction memory. is truth. Fiction <laughs> is truth. Memory is fiction. <laughs> yeah. Sam, I want to thank you uh, for coming on and, uh, and, and talking to us pleasure. today. I really, really appreciate it. And um, I hope we could do it again on, on some of the other Anytime. subjects we didn't get a chance to, to explore. Um, but thank you very much for coming on. Anytime. Thanks.